This is another challenging question. Detrusor instability out of all this, which drug is not used? There are two issues, doctor. One is called stress incontinence and the other is called detrusor instability or otherwise called urge incontinence. Don't you think that the, those two are opposite phenomena? Definitely. Why? In urge incontinence, the detrusor is uh, hyper contracting. So that is creating an urge. Whereas in stress incontinence, we need to strengthen the detrusor. I mean, we, we need to strengthen the uh, sphincter to prevent the incontinence from happening. So the pathophysiology will differ for these two. So the detrusor instability is basically urge incontinence. In the urge incontinence, we very much use uh, um, the flavoxate, oxybutynin, and um, uh, solifenacin, and uh, trospium, all, all these drugs. Now let us have one, two comments about each of them. What is this toliteridine? What is it basically doing and how will it help a patient of detrusor instability? Toliteridine is a competitive muscarinic receptor antagonist of detrusor. What contracts the detrusor, doctor? Estelcholine stimulation, muscarinic stimulation. Anything that antagonizes muscarin will weaken the detrusor. So muscarinic antagonist, receptor level antagonist called toliteridine is the one which will bring down that uh, hyper and irritable detrusor and helps a patient of urge incontinence. Similarly, solifenacin, one of the options given to you, is also another example of a drug which is a muscarinic receptor antagonist which has got an anticholinergic action and it will basically cause the inhibition of the bladder smooth muscle. But uh, what is the answer for this question? We don't use duloxetine. Then what is this duloxetine? Duloxetine is a 5-HT and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. And uh, this is the one norepinephrine and 5-HT, uh, where are they important for? Sphincters, because sphincter is more sympathetic. So basically what they will do is, they will make the sphincteric contractility to become stronger by causing the reuptake inhibition of the norepinephrine at the level of the sympathetic innervation of the sphincter and makes the stress incontinence from not happening. Because sphincter, if it is strong, even if uh, the detrusor is trying to push out the urine when the person is laughing or coughing, then uh, sphincter will prevent it. So that is the reason we use this. So duloxetine is used in summary for stress incontinence by strengthening the sphincter sympathetic uh, system by causing reuptake inhibition of uh, norepinephrine, whereas flavoxate, toliteridine, solafenacin, they all antagonize the muscarinic receptors and uh, cause parasympatholysis and cause the detrusor uh, um, weakness and uh, take care of urge incontinence. Now let's go to the next question. Hericeptin is a new anti-cancer drug, all of you know very well. It is a monoclonal antibody against the human epidermal growth factor receptor 2 which is implicated to be responsible, the overexpression of it is responsible for the breast cancer. And uh, all breast cancers don't express HER2 receptor. Only those which are aggressive, resistant to the chemotherapy kind of bad varieties of breast cancer, they express the HER2 receptor. So there is a reason, doctor, the HER2 expression makes it uh, a very good target and HER2 has, carries a bad prognosis. I see both of them, maybe recollection, we are able to, unable to recall it correctly, precisely rather. So what is the other name given for the Herceptin? It is the Transthuzumab. So you must be very sure on this uh, um, uh, Ebiximab, that map, this map, all these uh, Azerbaijan names of Afghanistan. You must uh, sure of uh, what are these uh, monoclonal antibodies because this is an emerging field. Immunotherapy is an emerging field. Now what is the bad prognostic factor in ALL? Without a question on leukemia, lymphoma, there is no question paper. So you must be very sure on the number gain. So, doctor, if there is a hyper-deployed blast, if they are there, those malignancies will take the methotrexate very well. So, they respond very well to chemotherapy. So, the presence of the hyper is a good prognostic factor, not bad. Age. If it is the age between 1 to 10 years, it carries a good prognosis. Then, how about WBC count? 
any very high leukocyte count is a bad prognostic factor so that is the reason out of all this um, 228 is a good hyperdiploid is good 922 has no relation uh, but I only see uh, WBC which is uh, high less than less than 50,000 was there good good so maybe then uh, uh, we need to then defend A <laughs> so uh, maybe another chromosome would have been given huh? 814 was given good good so there are some chromosomal specific chromosomes especially we need to remember it is the tel 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 aml1 fusion which has got an excellent prognosis and tel aml1 fusion is created by 1221 translocation which is the most common genetic abnormality observed in childhood all which is going to be the question in the next all india entrance now dialysis improves everything but not really the peripheral neuropathy they have done a large number of studies on this what type of ne neuropathy is the uremic neuropathy it is a dying back neuropathy or a central peripheral axonopathy fundamentally there is a segmental de demyelination which is there and um, generally it is not reversible if you do the dialysis this is a traditional question rheumatoid arthritis is differentiated from SLE by erosions non erosive arthritis is SLE erosive arthritis is rheumatoid arthritis anybody you are able to show erosions on the joint unlikely to be SLE arthritis that is always the rule very traditional question this is then arthritis conjunctivitis urethritis is all caused by the retus which is caused by the urea plasma urea lyticum 28 year old six nerve palsy t2 weighted image shows a homogeneous mass and uh, which is there in the cavernous sinus if it is there in cavernous area it what else can be it, it should be a cavernous hemangioma which will behave all those things only thing is we doubt it. maybe cavernous is given there cavernous can't be here it can, it can be also huh? so that is the thing so now you can see clearly on a mri how basically there is a accentuation of uh, the signal of the cavernous hemangioma and uh, along the bay of the cavernous sinus you have the abdescence which undergoes the paralysis is what need to be remembered stalactite growth on the agar your favorite question all of you are very sure on this that it is the arsenia pestis which typically creates a stalactite growth on the ghee broth uh, um, culture as all of you know very well gardner thorn break sporotrix is going to be your answer and what are rna what are dna viruses once more you have got a list to decide upon right so you have smallpox vaccinia herpes simplex adeno simian virus 40 they're all examples of dna not the rna whereas you have got um, the SARS virus, influenza, hepatitis C they all basically are the classical examples of the RNA virus where do you see clue cells another traditional question it is in the bacterial vaginosis particularly caused by the gardenella where the epithelial cells of the vagina they get a stippled appearance called the clue cells now this is a good question once more what is our uh, samjhota before going to entrance one question comes on viral hepatitis whether it is micro general medicine or anything very traditional paper this is so you need to know that hepatitis b can be a acute hepatitis chronic inactive hepatitis or it can be a chronic active hepatitis luckily only three options are there so you talk about chronic inactive versus chronic active in chronic active you find hbv dna levels which are high and HBS AG still is present there is uh, antibody against it is not yet developed and core antibody of IgG or IgM type is there so they are all indicative of a chronic active hepatitis and also the high AST ALT levels are also indicative of only thing I could not understand is did the examiner give DNA polymerase along with the DNA or not these two are given eh? okay then HBB DNA is found anti HBC is found in chronic active hepatitis and elevated ASD ALT are found so they are all the definite things I am not sure about what is this polymerase story then let us talk about the dengue fever how do you diagnose it many times we discuss there are so many ways but it is the IgM capture ELISA MAC ELISA is considered to be the most definitive way now in the rheumatoid arthritis criteria ankle is there elbow is there interphalangeal is there uh, then what is not there 
So you must know American College of Rheumatology criteria for rheumatoid arthritis. Morning stiffness longer than one hour. Arthritis three or more joints. It is the proximal interphalangeal, metacarpophalangeal and wrist joints and bilateral involvement of the joints and positive rheumatoid factor, rheumatoid nodules and radiological evidence of the rheumatoid arthritis. So this is how the elbow joint you can find the nodules and 90% will eventually will have ankle involvement. So you have PIP, MCP, wrist involvement, metatarsophalangeal but not uh, um, really the option C. Now let us go to the next question. Where do you have aldosterone receptors? Where are they located? So fundamentally aldosterone receptors are there on kidney, colon, heart, CNS, the adipose tissue which is brown tissue and also on the sweat glands. But um, it is not really there in the liver. So that becomes the answer here. Colon, collecting tubules, CNS, everywhere it is there. Now this is a good question. Is it the same question? Postprandial peristalsis was the word. Okay. First of all, what is postprandial peristalsis? What is the other name given for it? Gastrocolic reflex. The moment you eat food, food falls in stomach and that leads to development of a peristalsis in colon. Now the question is, which part of the colon will show the highest amount of these peristaltic waves? Then they have done a lot of manometric studies. They found it is the sigmoid colon which is more greatly affected than the right side of the colon in this phasic response of uh, gastrocolic re reflex. But I like to ask a question. Does colon has peristalsis by itself? You call peristalsis in stomach and the small intestine. You don't call it in colon. If colon also has got uh, bowel sounds, borborygmy, etc., etc., then uh, you have got a lot of uh, things to do. So there is a reason. Uh, it is called mass movement of uh, feces, not peristalsis exactly. But in gastrocolic reflex, the moment food falls into the stomach, uh, there are few peristaltic waves created in the colon and they are maximum in the sigmoid colon. Now let us talk about acarabos. I am very sure you will easily answer all the three. Only one thing you will doubt about is fibrinogen levels and acarabos. Where is this story related? So once more, one monogram of research says that those who are using acarabos have a decreased fibrinogen levels. So it not only helps for your sugar, it also helps for preventing stroke, preventing pro-clotting tendency, etc., etc. See, after MD there will be no other work. You will be suddenly doing a research on eating idlis, developing depression, <laughs> then uh, uh, what you call as uh, uh, weekend parties versus uh, uh, ST segment depression. So all rare studies, we used to have one uh, medicine professor. His job is every two, three days, one paper should come out. So as post that years, we used to run around to get new topics. So we decided that uh, weekend we will decide all the new, new, new topics. So we did all some rare, rare things. How many blood bank bags are being used on average per each uh, patient coming to us? How many of them spilled onto the floor? How much has spilled onto the floor? So finally, we ended up uh, three years of MD is over. So that no more uh, these um, peculiar studies. So everything will have a statistical relationship. See, if uh, 10 bald men are studied, incidentally they are all found to be MD. You can't say that uh, MD is achieved only by becoming bald. So finally clinical research will go into that insane propositions. So Acarabos that way has got a low fibrinogen level as an association is a true statement. Then it decreases intestinal absorption of glucose and also it prevents the retard, it retards the progression of a glucose intolerant state into a florid diabetes. They are all the very much the true statements. It has more to do with postprandial glucose levels, hyperglycemia levels, but also found to have a, if night, if you take good uh, acarabos, morning fasting values have got a relevance. Also, there is a proof. I am not quite sure what the examiner tries to ask. Spider nevi, where do you see and why do you see? It is an increased uh, estrogen activity which is responsible for it is what need to be remembered. Absence of the respiratory oxygen burst is implicated in which condition doctor? It is typically um, in the case of the uh, uh, NEDPH uh, oxidase deficiency uh, there can be uh, development of uh, um, inability to produce oxygen burst. Now a female patient has undergone 
cholecystectomy incidentally. You told her that, uh, don't worry madam, your gallbladder, you can live with it. Incidentally, some Dr. Goodlingham discovered stones. Uh, it, but uh, she said, no, 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 I am a perfect healthy human being. I can't afford to have a gallbladder with stones. Remove it. Why you are bothered when I am not bothered? Fine, you have removed it. Then histopathology report said, there is a malignancy inside it. Then she, she won't become cachexic because of the malignancy. Fear of dying will make her cachexic. So there's a reason you must be very sure. If incidentally gallbladder cancer is found in a cholecystectomy specimen, which is a very common clinical experience, if the tumor is in situ, or if it is only invading the lamina propria, and the margin of resection are negative, then post-operatively only observation alone, pray the God and plug. So there is nothing to do. But if the tumor is T1B or greater the margins of resection are positive, and um, then that becomes an indication for surgical resection um, is required. You need to actively intervene by doing the uh, partial hepatic resection with the regional lymphadenectomy. Now let's go to the next question. The woman has got a bloody discharge of the nipple with a ductectasia discovered. Now what are the two options surgically available for you? Either you can do microdocectomy or you can be able to do um, a much invasive process. But in the modern era we are doing microdocectomy in the management of the bloody nipple discharge of ductectasia. Now for the cholangiocarcinoma what are the different sites where it can happen? Perihilar location is the most common site for the bile duct cancer. And the intrahepatic location is the least common is what need to be remembered. Now why does mesenteric infarction occur? Is it the thrombosis in situ or is it an embolic shower? How does it happen? So generally it is the acute mesenteric arterial embolism most commonly responsible but rather than in situ atherosclerosis. But actually mesenteric occlusion is the ischemia is divided into acute and chronic. But I don't know whether examiner asked acute or chronic. Acute most common is embolism. Then there is another way called non-occlusive mesenteric ischemia. Let us say the patient went into a severe hypotension. There is a decreased perfusion to a lot of tissues including mesentery. That also can lead to the development of mesenteric ischemia. But out of all it is the embolism which is the most common is what need to be remembered. Now for a gastrointestinal stromal tumor with recurrence, what is the investigation of choice? Uh, this is a very good question. Actually, there are two options available for us. PET scan is one option. Second is CECT. Let us debate about uh, different uh, ways by which we investigate a gastrointestinal stromal tumor. There is also a role for the upper GI series and small bubble series and CT which are commonly used modalities for even evaluating anybody with uh, upper abdominal pain with a gastral, gastric uh, stromal tumor. Then positron emission tomography scanning using the fluoro 2 deoxyd glucose. It is mainly meant for detecting the metastatic disease and those disease conditions where it is recurring. So there is a reason by that logic this becomes an option better than that of the CECT. But CT will give you the size, the location of the tumor, relationship with the adjacent structures and it will divide the gastric stromal tumor into small, intermediate and large based on the size criteria. So that is the role of it. But I think recurrence was uh, precisely asked by the examiner. Okay. Now microangiopathic hemolytic anemia can occur with the prosthetic valves, TTP. Also those who have antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. And HELLP syndrome with eclampsic patients also can have microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. And those who are receiving heparin for a long period of time, they also develop uh, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia and signet ring cell carcinoma, the different causes. It is the NN kephali which can be detected as early as 10th week of pregnancy antenatal diagnosis by using the ultrasound. Now the patient is in obstructed labor with hydration, dehydration, hemodynamically unstable, signs of fetal demise are visible, then you plan for any destructive procedure, but uh, there are two destructive procedures which, uh, which have been uh, given over here. I am not uh, very sure whether two are given or not. They both are given. Okay. Now, primary 10 hours of painful contractions at 37 weeks of gestation without any effacement, with cervical dilatation of 1 centimeter, what is the next line of management? 
lot of times students will cry that sir you are giving big big long long case studies uh, in our uh, sunday test and all and too much of conceptual discussion is happening but definitely the modern exams are con converting more and more towards uh, the western exams with case study based i think it is more comfortable to have cases like this let us debate about this question do you like to call it as a cervical dystocia based on this history so we need to know when will we define the friedman has done a great work in 1955 by dividing the labor into the first stage second stage third stage within the first stage latent phase and active phase when do you call active phase of the labor the moment the cervical dilatation is around 3 to 4 cm you call it as an active phase here how many centimeters cervical dilatation is there 1 cm so still she is not entered into the active phase by the friedman's definition then when do you call it as a prolonged latent phase whenever the um, uh, uh, patient who is a nulliparous female if at all the duration of latent phase is exceeding 20 hours or if it is a multiparous female if it is increasing more than 14 hours uh, then you basically call it as a prolonged latent phase so this quickly summarizes the various abnormalities in the progression of the labor you have a prolonged latent phase prolonged second stage protracted dilatation protracted descent arrest of dilatation arrest of descent and prolonged third stage they are all the uh, different things and according whether nulli or uh, multipara it will decide let us quickly review it if it is greater than 20 hours it is prolonged latent phase greater than 14 in multipara and prolonged second stage if it is greater than 2 hours in nulliparous or greater than 1 hour in multipara protracted dilatation if it is less than 1.2 cm per hour in nulliparous less than 1.5 cm per hour in multipara i leave the remaining parameters in the notes given to you so any female who is in not in a active phase in which phase she is in she is in latent phase if she is in a prolonged latent phase it is wrong to define cervical dystocia only after from latent phase she enters into the active phase of the first stage of the labor and if it is not progressing then you think of cervical dystocia you don't call it cervical dystocia at this stage and another th important thing is still it is very early to define it as prolonged because it is only 10 hours that she had been laboring more than 20 hours she had been laboring and then you call it as a prolonged uh, latent phase in the case of um, the uh, nulliparous woman so what will you do even if it is a prolonged latent phase generally it is a sedation and rest and uh, observation will make it to further further and further on progress into so there is no active intervention required and that too with the cervical dilatation which is not even 3 centimeters no role for amniotomy so that's the reason that becomes unlikely to be a scenario and no need for oxytocin she already had contractions very well and cesarean is too early unless you have a flight to catch so there are no maternal indications there are maternal fetal obstetrician indications so the third thing is not uh, uh, at uh, met now let's go to the next question with Mac Roberts maneuver what will happen first of all what do we do in Mac Roberts maneuver the patient lies in a supine position her hips are flexed so that her thighs lie against her abdomen and uh, that will straighten the sacrum but generally post Mac Roberts maneuver the patients can have a foot drop so there's a reason sciatic nerve injury is a common uh, problem that uh, can become one of the complications now avoiding breastfeeding will decrease transmission of HIV from mother to child and uh, zero urine prophylaxis will definitely help is only role for vitamin A prophylaxis very much it is discovered that vitamin A prophylaxis also prevents so answer becomes vaginal delivery vaginal delivery instead of vaginal if you go for cesarean section you will decrease the vertical transmission so that's the reason A is accept about it now carcinoma cervix we don't do really CD scan as a part of the staging according to the FIGO criteria ovarian cystectomy was done serous cystadenoma was found which is a benign condition there is no need for a, a rapid intervention that's the reason only follow up is the one which is sufficient actually if, if the option was follow up with CA125 was there 
but generally in clinical practice even 125 is not really that commonly uh, preferred but but what is the problem with the ovarian and cystadenoma serous cystadenoma if discovered in one 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 side it has a bilaterality the other side will also have it so there is the reason there is a need for close follow up uh, that need to be basically administered now what is central dot sign in central dot sign there is a communicating cavernous sectasy of the biliary tract called as the carolis disease and if you do a cd scan on a carolis disease patient you can see those dilated intrahepatic bile ducts which look like the centrally placed dots on the liver on ct which is seen in the case of the carolis disease endometrial thickness is 8 uh, uh, millimeters and um, patient presents with dysfunctional uterine bleeding she is a 45 year old is the age given age was also given then what do you want to do what is the difference between uh, uh, endometrial curettage and the histopathology doctor if you do endometrial biopsy you are only taking from one wall curettage means from everywhere so the recommendation generally is if there is a severe tub and you are having a high grade of suspicion about the malignancy there is a role for curettage otherwise endometrial biopsy and histopathology is a sufficient uh, uh, sample is what need to be basically remembered so endometrial biopsy is indicated for all patients more than 35 years obese patients those who have diabetes hypertension suspected polycystic ovarian syndrome for all of them and dnc is indicated if at all uh, biopsy is contraindicated or if there is a heavy uncontrolled bleeding that is another indication for dilatation and curettage and uh, it is only anovulatory dub where progestins have got a role and it should be um, only when you are clear cut about the diagnosis then only progestins are the ones which are basically administered now refractory histiocytosis what is the treatment of choice how many have you seen case of histiocytosis han challer christian disease with uh, all the skelvarial defects unlikely so once more in that uh, we want to know what is the general treatment what is the refractory treatment so too much of uh, um, ozone layer imagination in the entrances right uh, or maybe too much of expectation of examiner to screen you through a coffee filter huh? so let us talk about it uh, recurrence of a suppose if a histiocytosis is treated if one isolated bone lesion has recurred so what uh, our ancestor said is use nsaids inter intralesional steroids is the treatment and those who do not have a good response to the traditional treatment what is the traditional treatment of histocytosis vinblastin corticosteroids methotrexate mercaptopurine etoposide if there is no response then you try to use in them the cladribin which is considered to be the treatment of choice for a refractory hairy cell leukemia refractory histocytosis and chronic lymphocytic leukemia also we use the cladribin is what need to be basically remembered now there are novel therapies like myeloplatelet therapy intravenous immunoglobulin etc etc how do you assess in bullous emphysema the volume of the lung first of all why do you want to assess because lung resection is by part of the surgery in the management of bullous emphysema so generally it is the spirometric assessment of fev1 and uh, the diffusion of the carbon monoxide the capacity of it that the two very good indicators of the residual lung volume is what has to be basically remembered so that's the reason dlcvo is a more uh, reasonable answer to know the lung volume assessment now what is bio safety level 1 2 3 4 you heard of this because we are all in the era of uh, nuclear bombs bio terrorism etc etc so there is a reason uh, you need to know that there are one to four levels bio safety level 1 means it is a very low risk infectious condition and uh, minimal precautions are required so e coli chicken pox hepatitis they are all examples general bacteria like streptococcus everything and viruses they are all examples of bio safety level 1 safety level 2 means moderate risk is there but if infected patients have a treatment and there is a vaccine available but still it is a contagious condition like hepatitis a b c influenza a lyme disease dengue fever salmonella mumps etc etc then bio safety level even mrsa falls in safety level 2 and there is no vaccine available highly contagious 
then West Nile fever, Venezuelan fever, then Eastern equine fever, Rocky Mounted Spotted fever, yellow fever, they all come under this group, even anthrax also in the biosafety level 3. Then you have the biosafety level 4 where they are extremely hazardous kind of organisms like Ebola virus, Lassa fever, etc., etc. Too, much, too many things. Now let us talk about the rubella. Rubella is more severe when it infects the baby in the first trimester of pregnancy, not in the second trimester. Now what are the Framingham's major and minor criteria for diagnosing heart failure? As a good clinical student, we must have all these things in tips. The presence of paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, nequine distension, pulmonary edema, S3 gallop, CVP more than 16, hepatojugular reflex, pulmonary edema, weight loss of 4.5 kgs in 5 days, they are all the major criteria. Whereas, um, you have got the minor criteria which include bilateral ankle edema, nocturnal cough, hepatomegaly, pleural effusion, tachycardia, they are all the minor Framingham criteria to call. So there is a reason Dr. Hepatomegaly falls basically in the minor, not the major Firmingham's criteria. That is the final story. To add to the misery of life, we also have one more classification of NIHA, New York Heart Association. At least we must be uh, reasonably sure about it. Very simple, ordinary physical activity, less than ordinary physical activity. Finally, even at rest also, if there is dyspnea, then you call it as class 4. So, you must be very sure. If there is a vagal stimulation, there is a parasympathetic stimulation of the AV node, which will decrease the conduction through it. And AV node will decide the RR interval. So, RR interval on the ECG become prolonged if there is any vagal parasympathetic stimulation is what need to be remembered. Now, what are phase 1 and phase 2 reactions? Another traditional question in the entrance. You must be very sure. Oxidation, reduction, hydrolysis, they belong to phase 1. Whereas uh, glutathione transferase, acetyl transferase, conjugation, sulfur transferase, mercaptinuric uh, uh, sulfur, uh, um, I mean mercaptinuric acid biosynthesis, they are all the phase 2. Then another traditional question, cyclodevelopmental propagation, where do you see? The disease agent will undergo only a development but no multiplication, which you see in microfilaria in the case of cyclodevelopmental. Then what do you mean by the mean filling pressure of the heart? It is the average arterial and also the venous pressure which is necessary to fill the circulation with the blood which is called as um, the mean filling pressure um, is uh, what you need to be very sure about. Now this is a good question. Presynaptic inhibition versus postsynaptic inhibition in the neurotransmission. What is the difference between the two? How can uh, inhibition can occur, doctor, for a simple chemical nerve signal to progress? Two ways. Either neurotransmitters, if they are depleted, then progression of the nerve signal cannot occur. Second is, if there is a hyperpolarization of the membrane, then when the signal arrives, that hyperpolarized membrane is not ready to respond and take it and propagate. Two ways. So, presynaptic and postsynaptic differ in the virtue of their... Uh, I mean uh, the physiological mechanism. In presynaptic inhibition, fundamentally it is the uh, decrease of the neurotransmitter which is responsible. Whereas postsynaptic inhibition is also um, uh, is the one where you have the hyperpolarization of the membrane due to the increased chloride conductance is responsible for the inhibition is what um, you need to remember. Now the T cell is a naive cell. It does not know who is antigen, who is antibody, etc., etc. It does not know how to multiply also. It is like a first year MBBS student. Then who will do ragging and make it to become a robust T cell? Who knows that uh, which professor's class to bunk, which professor's class proxy attendance uh, and where to jump, etc., etc. So it is the mature dendritic cell fellow who is the third year MBBS who will come and say that why to read Gray's anatomy if you read Gray you will get uh, Clodanfenicol Gray syndrome or your uh, gray matter will degenerate, something he will say. <laughs> so finally, he will see to that 10% uh, of Chaurasia how to read and get 90% score in <laughs> MBBS first year. So, uh, uh, Krishnanand Swamiji of third year will tell first year uh, Chota Swamiji how to pass exams partly. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, basically, fundamentally,
we we started uh, giving coaching right from our uh, second year mbbs days those days all final year guys uh, who are worrying about how to read davidson and all that uh, we used to say don't worry sisha we have got a very quick way of uh, reading 10% of davidson so uh, ideally it should be see uh, it is uh, together reading and preparing where uh, you become instant guru and also instant sishya for your colleague that is the fun and joy of preparing so it is a antigen presenting mature dendritic cell which will cause the naive t cell to become co stimulated is what you need to basically remember i dumped a little literature in your explanatory booklet please uh, kindly go through that now what are the prion related disorders is a very important question you have sporadic cjd and uh, familial uh, fatal insomnia scrapy amelanosis uh, etc they are all prion related and prion itself is basically a wrongly folded protein as all of you know very well when will actually tendinitis occur doctor when we have gone uh, to purchase a high heel shoe so a new shoe buying is the most common cause that for your patients uh, uh, pain in the hle tendon insertion area unsuitable footwear is responsible now catheter associated endocarditis is commonly because of which organism generally it is right sided and it is more often uh, fungal but no fungi being given um, uh, within this organisms i am not sure what was given but definitely the um, stenotrophomonas maltophila otherwise called pseudomonas maltophila is uh, an implicated agent in the catheter related uh, uh, endocarditic episodes now patient presented with multiple fractures petechial rash tachypnea tachycardia fat embolism you will answer it on telephone now a term baby with fever tachypnea not improved with surfactant first of all surfactant is not required for uh, a term baby right so i think maybe in the frame of the question somewhere we missed the vital clues now a patient completed 8 days of 10 day course of sifaclor and now presented with fever rash lymphadenopathy what is it it is a drug induced arthritis reaction that he has developed and which is a type 3 type of a hypersensitivity reaction the patient has got a diffuse gallbladder thickening and there is a hyper echoing shadow with a comet tail artifact then um, what is this condition fundamentally the thickening of the gallbladder doctor is a common finding as a house surgeon you go and check 10 beds at least eight beds will have thickening if uh, the patient is a 40 female fertile and above a little obese how to interpret that thickening of the gallbladder wall let us talk about it